Hi folks, it's Andy. Welcome to today's Kendall Rant. Right, let's get straight into the questions. We've got some great ones today. Okay, so uh, coming off the uh, video that I posted yesterday about how to be a good teacher, we've got some great comments. Uh, first one says, Hi Andy, a rather personal question. Uh, who are your favourite competitive uh, professional Kendall car? Um, brackets, i.e. just based on their physical movements, effect effectiveness in Shi'ai, etc. Regardless of rank, uh, Japanese, non-Japanese, and whether you have uh, met them personally or not, of course. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, uh, who are the Kendoka that influenced you personally uh, the most on the non-physical aspect? Uh, how were their mental and spiritual understandings of Kendo so striking for you? Okay, uh, <laughs> that's a cool question, I like it. Um, okay, um, who is my favorite uh, professional uh, competitive kendo gawa? Some of my favorite competitors actually probably aren't considered professional, I don't know if you would or not. Don't know, um, I've got a lot, I've got a lot. Um, because I really put a lot of value into what's called Mitori Geiko, which is where you watch other kendo and then try and absorb that into your own kendo. Uh, and I have been since, pretty much the beginning of my kendo career. So I've always been watching very high level uh, kendo. Um, I'm very lucky to have been in a position where most of my kendo uh, heroes, shall we say, uh, for the most part I've, actually, I've met them or I even know them on a personal level um, now. Uh, but, you know, um, if we're literally gonna throw names out there, <laughs> uh, in terms of their actual uh, effectiveness in uh, Shi'ai, for example, or their physical mood, movements or what have you. Um, well, uh, my, my, my biggest favourite is, of course, Ega, Ega Naoki-sensei. Um, he's been an absolute inspiration to my kendo right from the start, um, particularly because in Europe, uh, I'm sort of on the short side. I'm not a really tall guy, and um, actually Ega-sensei is not a super tall guy either, but still he's like an absolute beast. Um, so, I, you know, I, I really... Um, appreciate his kendo and I, like I say I have I have from the start um, I'm also really influenced by um, Takanabe Susume Sensei as well uh, largely because we're actually pretty much exactly the same physical size and build um, and I, I, I think his kendo is beautiful it's absolutely beautiful um, and I, I'd love to be able to do kendo like that um, so yeah that's another one who I, I very much uh, admire um, I mean, of course, I admire the. I'm, I, I love all the greats. I love all the greats. Teramoto Sensei, um, Uchimura Sensei. You know, um, of course, Miyazaki Sensei. Uh, of course, I do. But um, I, one of them, more, another very influential one to me is a less well-known person called uh, Tachibana Yoshito Sensei. He's a seventh dan at the moment. Um, he was third place in the All Japan's, I think. Um, years ago when he was like 25 or something but it was the first time he entered um he's uh he's actually a graduate of the same high school of uh, my wife went to uh so i have actually met him uh and practiced with him a few times um and he's he's just awesome uh he's been in like the todolf ken shiai and stuff like that a few times as well um i really really love his kendo it's just really simple and beautiful um i also really like um uh, uh, Asahina Sensei from um, Kanagawa. Uh, he's uh, he's really cool, actually. I really love his kendo. The guy's an absolute beast, I and mean, he's massive, like compared to other Japanese people. He's much bigger than me, um, and he's. I I just love the kind of. Um, I, I hesitate to use the word sort of aggressive aspect of his kendo, but it's like. It's really explosive, and his waza is just so, um, kind of, I don't know, it's like, it's a little bit rough around the edges, but I just love it, you know? And I've seen a video of his seventh dan exam, and he, like, totally beasts the other guy um, for one of it. And then the other, the other he does with another one of the really influential people to me, which is uh, uh, Yonea Sensei. He's, uh, he's also been in New Japan lots of times, from Saitama. Um, absolutely love that guy's kendo as well. I mean, there's so many. I could just keep going. I could keep, keep going, keep going. Um, uh, yeah. Um, there's there's a couple of non-Japanese um, competitors who I really, really do uh, 
think a lot of and I really respect um, and I know them on a personal level. Um, I'm not going to throw the names out here uh, <laughs> though because I haven't talked to them about doing that in this video and I don't think that would be fair for me to do that. Um, but there are um, some other non-Japanese players that um, they are to me they're very 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 uh, influential and I, I look up to them a lot um, and uh, yeah I mean they, they can they obviously compete at the top level, they compete at the World Championships, stuff like that. Um, but what I love about those guys is um, they've got a real passion that burns in them when they step on the Shi'ai jaw. Um, something, they've got a real, um, I don't even know, it's hard to sort of formulate into words, but something something burns in them, yeah. When they step on the Shi'ai jaw, uh, something about that the whole aura sort of changes and something burns in them that's just, um, it's just not in the normal person uh, from what I've seen. Um, and I really, I really, really look up to that and it's, it's, it's done really well for those guys and they've obviously um, really, really benefited from it. Uh, in terms of kendoka that have influenced me personally uh, on a non-physical aspect, um, like sort of a mental and spiritual understanding of kendo, um, there's quite a few. Um, again, these are mainly sensei that I've met in Japan. I mean, don't forget I did more kendo in Japan than anywhere else. So um, I guess uh, one of them that really sticks out is uh, my sensei from when I lived in Kyoto, a dojo that I practiced at there. I think I've told a story about him before where first time, a couple of times I practiced with him, I just like tried my best to hit him as much as I can. And obviously it's because I was just young. Um, I was able to hit him by, you know, and then he just hit this amazing Dibana men on me. And like, it just kind of hammered home to me really that Kendo wasn't just about hitting, um, hitting the bogo with the Shinai. But like, I couldn't just stand there and hit the straight men on him if I wanted to. I had to kind of cut corners or go around the sides, um, even though he was sort of, um, you know, uh, he was like older than, well, yeah, I mean, he was like two generations older than me. So, um, you know, that, that was quite a big thing. But um, in terms of uh, other sort of things. Um, my father-in-law is a, is a big influence um, and my wife as well. Uh, they're both kendoka. Um, even though we don't really practice together very much uh, and uh, I, I've never practiced kendo with my father-in-law but we talked about kendo a lot even though he's, uh, he's you know, he was a member of the Fukuoka police uh, kendo uh, actual tokuren back in the, back in the day, <laughs> uh, years and years ago. Um, and his, uh, yeah, I mean, his, his sort of approach to Kendo is, uh, has, has been a very big influence on me. Um, and yes, it's, that's passed on to his daughter, who's my wife, and, um, I, I, you know, I share a lot of it with her as well. So, um, so yeah, uh, and I'm not sure that's the sort of answer you were looking for, um, but I hope it's to some extent, uh, interesting. Okay, uh, <laughs> um... Handy, do you have any experience with how a university club operates? Uh, my club has a separation of leadership duties. The administrative duties, uh, like booking the room, communicating with the athletics department and recruitment is handled by students, while instruction is done by a senior senpai and our sensei. <clears throat> as one of our senior students, I got the dual role of leading the student admin team as well as helping with instruction. This kind of organisation of the leadership strongly relies on students handling the club affairs. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the senpai and senpai, uh, sensei can focus on instruction with students coming in and out of the club, either quitting or graduating and moving away. What are some ways you think you could consistently? Uh, what are some ways you think to consistently have a dedicated group of student leaders? Okay. Uh, right. I don't have a lot of experience. Um, with how a university club operates, um, I didn't go to university, so I, <laughs> um, I don't, uh, I didn't, I, I did practice at um, 
when I was sort of university, a little bit older than university age, uh, and I lived in London for a bit, I, I practiced at a university, a couple of university clubs down there, um, and I've practiced at university club um, up here actually in, um, in the north as well, a couple of times. Um, I think it's really difficult, the organisation of a university club, because from what I see from the outside, yeah, you've got the people who teach, and then you've got the people that sort of make sure the club works all right. Um, and to some extent, that's how the club that I actually practised at in Manchester works as well. I don't have anything to do with the organisation of it at the moment. Not really, anyway. Um, just, I, I just turn up and teach, really. <laughs> um, now, yeah, I think the problem you're always going to have with this sort of university club is that you have, you're have you always going to have a high turnover of students because they're only there for a certain amount of time and then they leave and, they, you know, they move back and go back to their hometown or whatever. Uh, that's one thing. And then, um, you know, if it, it, it's very difficult because what you have is new students coming in and then you, you, you're trying to get them into Kendall um, in the first place, getting enthused about Kendall and then to sort of layer on an extra level of responsibility, which is some sort of part of the club, um, uh, what do you call it, organisation, um, can be really tough. Um, and obviously it, it can have some serious holes because at the end of the day, you know, the people running the club are just students and don't have the same um, life experience as um, a group of um, sort of older people running a, a private club. Um, for the most part, that's not true in all cases, of course. Um, but what can you do? I mean, essentially, what you need to be trying to do is you need to be trying to recruit people, obviously, into the club when the first years, and then by the time the second years, hopefully they're still in Kendall. Um, and you need to try and get those second years then into the organisation role. So people take up that organisation role or start some sort of organisation role from being a second year and then through to the third or fourth year, hopefully they can carry it over and move on to a different one and a different second year will take over what they did. Um, and I think if nothing else, uh, it's just going to be a case of throwing as many people at it as you can. So you need to get as many new recruits in your club as you possibly can. So I'd, I'd really push hard on recruitment, trying to get as many students into the Kendall Club as you possibly can. So you need to be really open and really try your best to get as many people and then hopefully some of them will stick and then those ones that stick then can hopefully step up to actually um, organise in the actual uh, the club itself. Um, I don't have much more experience really in it to comment, comment further on it, I'm afraid. Um, next one. Uh, thank you so much for your help. I th I'm not going to just sit here and read how much you're thanking me, but thank, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I need your advice. Uh, what should you do when the person who is teaching the session doesn't know what they're talking about and doesn't show correct form and doesn't seem to even try? I can't just let them teach people the wrong things. I'm not talking about controversial things like showing correct design for a particular waza, but like saying semi is just a step forward, uh, bouncing their shinai, not cutting the correct height and putting no effort into their cuts. I've tried to talk to them one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but they did not respond and did not change their form. And I feel as if they resent me for telling them that I was wrong. Um, I know it's important to always listen to your teacher and respect them and not tell them um, what they are saying is wrong, especially during the session. But I can't really bear for people at my daughter to learn bad and incorrect Kendall. It's hard to explain, but when uh, they're being taught incorrectly, it genuinely hurts me. Uh, I don't know how, but I hope you can understand what I mean. I don't know what to do. I seem to think it's more... Uh, uh, they seem to think it's more of a hobby than a boodle. Uh, again, thank you so much for the help. Okay. Uh, okay. <sighs> that is a tough situation, all right? Um, and it's going to be hard now because you've gone to this person and told them that um, you don't really like the job that they're doing. Um, right. Okay. This is really difficult and it really depends on the situation that you're in. So it's hard for me to give you a, a, a sort of catch-all situation. Um, if, if this person that you're talking about is the person that also taught you, Kendall, um, and is somewhat quite a long way senior to you, uh, this isn't going to be a nice answer, but you kind of just got to suck it up. Um, you know, I've, I've experienced it. Um, not just here in the West, but in Japan too. I've, I've been in like Kendall uh, lessons in Japan where the teacher's sort of senior to me and I've thought, this is kind of a load of, 
load of rubbish. Uh, but you know, you kind of just have to. You just kind of just have to deal with it um, yourself. You kind of just have to let it go um, because first of all, uh, you obviously feel like. I mean, there is. You know, obviously, I mean this in the best faith, all right? So don't don't take this the wrong way. But I'm obviously only hearing your side of it, yeah? So um, it, it could be that, you know, you're, you're misunderstanding this teacher um, and you're actually wrong about some of the things. I'm not saying that's the case. It's just a possibility, right? Um, all I would say is that, yeah, I mean, if they are vastly experienced to you or they are quite a lot higher than you or they've been there a lot longer or they're, they're your original teacher or something like that, you're going to just have to like, just leave it. You know what I mean? I just I just leave it. And the best thing you can do, and it's going to be difficult now because you've already gone to them and said that you think that the way they're teaching is wrong. Um, but, you know, if there's a way you can get around that still is go to them and just try and see if there's you can, if there's a way you can... Um, you know, take more teaching in the class. So, you know, trying to say, look, can I, uh, I'd really like to teach one of the sessions a week or something, or um, could I do an hour of teaching tonight or something like that? Or, um, you know, so that you can get your influence in there as well. Um, but that's obviously gonna be difficult, I understand, because you've obviously, you might, you may have upset that person by telling them you don't agree with their teaching method. Um, if, on the other hand, this person is somebody that's like a similar level to you or like you've you've been practicing at the same same amount of time or something like that, or like you've come into the dojo and you like that person's not, you know, like that much senior to you or something like that, then I think it's okay for you to have that conversation that you've had and then just say, well, look, right, we obviously disagree on this and that, which is fine, right? Because there's lots of ways to interpret lots of things at Kendall. So why don't we just split the teaching, right? And then people can make up their own mind. Um, but I get the feeling from your sort of the way you've written it that you don't have enough control to do that. So like in terms of you don't have enough control in the club uh, to be able to do that. So maybe maybe that's not an option. I don't know. You'll have to figure that out, I'm afraid. Um, in terms of worrying about the other members of the club, um, I, you don't have to worry about them that much, right? For two reasons, right? Like you said, there's two types of people. There's the people that are really serious and they really want to get better at Kendo and then there's the people that do it like as a, you know, it's... Uh, uh, one 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 sense I know says uh says something like um what is it Ken, Kendo on a Tuesday and uh, salsa on a on a Wednesday or something like that you know it's like it's a, it's a hobby like you said um, <laughs> uh, it's yeah some people are like that and look the people that are serious and are really doing their best to get better even if they've got a teacher that's kind of you feel is kind of leading them in a slightly the wrong direction uh, i think they'll see through it in the end and they'll they'll they'll, they'll come back around they'll come back around onto the right path um and you can just do your best to be the best example that you can be um make sure that you're doing your best to go outside of your club as well so do your best to get to tournaments or events seminars stuff like that and encourage as much as you possibly can your club mates to go along with you so that they can experience kendo outside of your club as well so even if um you know even if your teacher isn't necessarily listening to you directly um at least you can kind of try and get outside influence to them um in that way so um yeah that's uh, that. That's the best I can do on that. I think. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> uh, next one. This one is coming uh, on the Kendo Show Early Access Group. If you're not in that group, get in that group. Uh, there's a link in the in the description there. Uh, it's a free group that I basically when I do uh, post new instructional videos and I do have some more coming soon. I really, really do. I'm just working on editing them. Um, <laughs> uh, they go in there before they go anywhere else. So you get early access to it. And it's also a great forum where people uh, sort of talk about Kendo and stuff and they throw in the questions for me for these videos too. Um, but under those questions come a load of comments. So you get loads of different opinions, not just mine, which I think is brilliant. Um, okay, uh, now this is a great one. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that it's been it's been brought up. There's a few comments that I haven't re really read them all, but okay. Hello, Andy uh, and fellow Kendo Show members. Uh, my question is on the senpai kohai relationship that exists between Kendo players. Uh, that exists between Kendo players. In your opinion, is this a lifelong bond? 
Furthermore, what happens to this relationship when typically, because of various factors such as age, health, lifestyle, etc., the kohai become technically much better than a senpai, or even a higher grade than a senpai? Does this re uh, relationship fall away? And if not, how are each supposed to conduct themselves under these new circumstances? I hope you can enlighten me, and perhaps a few others on this matter, um, either here or via your Kendra rants. Okay, great. Right. This is a super difficult topic because, it's not difficult, but it's a super interesting topic because senpai kohai, right, it's, um, in Japanese it's called the jōge kanke, so the uh, relationship between um, above and below, all right? So Japanese society works around a very hier hierarchical um, kind of structure. So um, throughout life, it's not a kendo thing, right? Senpai kohai is not a kendo thing, right? It's, an, it's a life thing, right? So in your life, you have people that are um, above you and people who are below you in terms of status within um, the joge kanke, right? It's not got anything to do with how much money you've got or how, where you, you know, what class you were born into. It's not that kind of thing, right? Um, but it, it's influenced by other factors, right? Um, the biggest one and obvious, most obvious one is age, right? So in general, um, the senpai is somebody that's come before you and kohai is somebody that's come after you, all right? So um, it, in a particular aspect of life or activity, you have people that have been there before you and people that are going to come into it after you, right? So... Um, the biggest and obvious one is age, yeah? Because that's in life in general. You have your senpai, they're the people that are older than you, and you have your kohai, the people that are younger than you, right? So um, straight off the bat, someone that's older than you holds a higher position in the joge kanke than you do, all right? That's one aspect of it. It's not the only one, though, and those things can kind of get messed up. Um, the most common one, um, where it's particularly spoken about is in the school system, all right? So um, they're very much focused around this senpai kohai thing within the school system. So when you join school, everybody who's in the school above you, uh, in the school years above you, or has previously graduated that school is your senpai from that school, all right? As far as that school's concerned, they're your senpai. And everyone that comes into the school in lower years than you after you move years up and after you graduated everyone that joins that school is your kohai right and that that exists forever yeah it's a it's a forever thing um it's not only the school it can also be uh, obviously university as well but um it can also be in a company if you join a company and this is where the age thing gets mess messed up because if you join a company the people that work there longer than you are your senpai at the company, even if they're younger than you, all right? So it gets a little bit confusing. Um, so what, what does that mean? Okay, so if somebody's your senpai, it means that you have to uh, use honorific language towards them. And to a large extent, you have to... Um, I'm kind of glossing, not, not really glossing over, but I'm kind of overgeneralizing, but you kind of have to do what they say. <laughs> it kind of puts them in a position of power over you, in a way, right? Um, and that relationship then goes down from you to your kohai. Um, so, in Kendall, how it works, right? Um, obviously, we have the dan grades, right? Or the Q grades, even. We have the dan grades. But... Actually, um, for most people in Kendo, it goes off their uh, school year because um, most people doing Kendo in Japan are still at school, right? About 70 odd percent of people doing Kendo in Japan are high school age or younger, right? Um, or university year, all right? So even if you're first dan and you're a third year high school student and there's a second dan who's in the second year, you are still a senpai. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with your, your dan grade. Uh, and in fact, in Japan, your dan grade is very rarely considered um, even uh, at all in determining who's a senpai and who's the kohai. It generally comes, people are um, generally, uh, it's generally decided in different ways. All right, so um, 
it's weird because like you could go to the dojo and um, even if you didn't like, for example, I went to I used to teach at a, a kid's dojo, but there was lots of adult teachers there. Now, I didn't have any senpai there. I didn't have any kohai there, right? Because I didn't go to school in Japan. Yeah, I didn't um, start kendo in that dojo. <clears throat> um, I just was a teacher there um, after joining it um, sort of later on in life. So in that dojo, I didn't have any specific senpai. Now, of course, there were many adult sensei who were also much older than me or higher graded than me. Um, and I can obviously respected them in their position in that way. And because they are older than me, I treated them in a way that I would as if they were kind of um, a senpai. And in return, they would kind of, I wouldn't say they, it was a bit different because we're adults. Yeah, so we, we spoke to each other in mutual respect, essentially. Um, but at the same time, there's weird stuff, like if you go out for drinks after practice, like the lower person is supposed to pour the drinks for the higher person, stuff like that. So there is that sort of thing. Um, so the thing is, is I, I, I know I feel like I seem like I'm going off topic a bit, but what I'm saying is the Senpai Kohai thing, the whole Joge Kanke thing is much bigger than Kendall. It's much bigger than Kendall. Um, but it's extremely important within the concept of Kendo, uh, context of Kendo, sorry, in Japan, all right? So, um, because you have all sorts of stuff going on in Japan that you don't do in the West, and I'm not saying we should do it in the West because our culture doesn't allow for it, and there's, you know, we don't have to, be I think, my opinion is, is that we should, I believe Kendo to be a very Japanese uh, activity that's very, uh, involved in Japanese culture, but I don't think that we have to become Japanese to do kendo. So we don't have to necessarily do everything that they do in Japan, outside of Japan. Um, stuff like, stuff like if, you know, if you're a, you know, if, if, if you're somebody senpai, then they, they, you could make them pack up your boga for you or fold up your hakama or something like that. And that happens a lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, in terms of where the sort of, in, certainly in Japan, right? And this is where the whole system comes from and how it's meant to work, yeah? Just because somebody overtakes you in a grade or gets better than you, yeah, um, doesn't mean that, um, doesn't mean that suddenly they're your senpai, yeah? So let's take a real example, all right? From the Kendo world, right? So the Japanese national team, right? Uh, what happened um, in the... Uh, Let's look at the, okay, for example, let's talk about um, uh, Nishimura-san, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nishimura from the Japanese team, All Japan Champion, extremely hard, uh, like really good kendo player, right? And he has a kohai from university um, who's also on the Japanese uh, team, uh, Mr. Takenoichi. They went to the same university. Uh, just in different years. So Mr. Nishimura is ta uh, Mr. Takenoichi's senpai. Now, their relative ability, of course, both of them are exceptionally good at Kendall. Yeah. Um, but okay, so in the world championships in Tokyo, Mr. Takenoichi beat Mr. Nishimura, right? He, so he wins. Does that mean that he's now a senpai? No, it doesn't, right? Um, it doesn't matter if. Mr. Nishimura stops Kendo tomorrow, it's not gonna happen, but if he stops Kendo tomorrow and never picks up a Shinai again, spends the rest of his life as sick Dan, which is what he is now, and uh, Mr. Takenoichi carries on Kendo for the rest of his life and becomes eighth Dan, Mr. Nishimura will always be his senpai. <laughs> always, right? And they will always have that relationship. Um, so that's how that will work, all right? And I've seen it, I've seen lots of, um, not lots of, but I've seen examples of, say, a uh, very, very famous, I won't mention the name, um, but a very, very famous 8th uh, Dan Sensei. Um, when he was at his high school uh, New Year practice, I've seen him sit on the lower side of someone who was like 6th Dan or 7th Dan, yeah? Um, because they were his senpai, yeah? Because they graduated the school a year earlier than him or the university a year earlier than him, or something like that. So he, even though, you know, he's the eighth Dan that's super famous, the Hanshi eighth Dan actually, super famous all around the world, and, and in Japan too, um, 
he's the one that's sitting lower and taking the lower position to his senpai, despite the fact that he's actually sixth dan or seventh dan, all right? Um, because yeah, it's, it's kind of irrelevant to, the, to your ability in that way. Um, so yeah, <laughs> having said that, having said that, lastly, just last point on that, um, when you're talking about like adults especially, like if you've got two adults who are like in the mid 30s, say you've got one who's 35 and one who's 34, and they went to the same school, so the one who's 35 is a senpai, like he's not gonna be like treating the guy that's 34 like, like garbage, which is what they tend to do at university and school. Um, like they like make them clean up after them and they like make them, you know, they kind of pick on them. Uh, it's, it's a very problematic system, I must say. It's very problematic, um, especially when boys and girls are involved uh, because there's, there's a lot of um, advantage taken by their uh, males over their junior females. Um, but uh, that side, that's not a Kendall thing, that's a, a societal thing. Um, but yeah, when they get to adulthood, when they're in the sort of mid-30s, then they're just really mates, or they're just normal. Unless unless one of them's a bit of a... I'm not going to swear, but like an uh, unsavoury person. <laughs> if one of them's a bit like that, then yeah, maybe. But then he's not going to have many friends, yeah? So once once it gets, to, gets into adulthood, then people just treat each other with mutual respect. And yeah, oh, he's actually my senpai, but, you know, oh, actually he's my kohai sort of thing, but it's, it, you know, it's generally not a big thing in everyday life uh, when it gets to that stage. Um, but yeah, <laughs> uh, a bit of an abstract topic. Um, I hope I didn't kind of, uh, kind of go, go off the sort of rails with it too much. Um, but yeah, um, I think that'll do in terms of what I've got to say on it. <laughs> uh, if, it do, if it's not clear though, then leave me a comment, ask me more about it. Um, ask me about other stuff as well. There's a comment section, that's what it's there for. Like, share, subscribe, all the stuff, you know, all the things you're supposed to do. Um, but do you know what the most important one is? I think you can guess. There it is. <laughs> Shop at kendostar.com because it is the best kendo uh, equipment website in the world, of course. Uh, it's top quality gear. It's all selected and designed by myself. Um, I'm operating the website, of course. That's why I'm plugging it. It's what, <laughs> it what, it's what, um, it's what keeps the lights on and keeps me making these videos. So if you do like what I'm doing, make sure you do your Kendo shopping at kendostar.com. Uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.